procedural, the counter plan, the commerce clause argument, and then the gender event. Okay. Commerce clause argument. It's the commerce clause case. Oh, it's K. Okay. Off case. Okay. Pretty good. Okay. Thank you. First, on the procedural arguments, we mean that they cite economic means, which thinks in our interpretation that is not enough to just cite the point of the Constitution and the case that you will rule. There needs to be some kind of justification or how that would interact with future cases. And this is bad for predictability because we don't know what actually happens when future commerce clause cases cross the room. Is damning on this point. He can't explain if a random issue came up on a future commerce clause issue. How that case would be decided. His first point is that it's key to counterplanning our opportunity and our standard that we can't craft a competitive counterplan against this because the only thing we can necessarily counter a counterplan out of would be commerce clause ground. But we don't know how they function. We don't know what is used on the commerce clause ground on a rational basis or deference to Congress is used, which spikes out of our key counterplanning ground, which is why we necessarily have to write a big counterplan that we do. He says we under limit for the test, but we don't under limit. They should still be forced to use the original decision on commerce clause or 14th Amendment, but they should have to explain how that functions in terms of the ground, which is that this is functionally a big business issue. He's dropping our bidirectionality standard that this allows them to necessarily go in both directions because they can just use a new test under the commerce clause to overrule Morrison, which means we don't even know what would happen to Bobo. He says it's abusive picks, but we would argue that it's essential pick ground to be able to pick out of this. This will also be on the picks debate on the counterplan. He says there's no evidentiary standard, but he's dropping our argument that this, this should be about competing interpretations. If we can prove why their interpretation, they have zero offense for their interpretation of the resolution, whereas we can prove why they're necessarily bad, you should vote on this. He says you give them some leeway, but there's no reason for this extent. Our standard, why you should necessarily evaluate plan in a vacuum, and if the plan in a vacuum is inherently vague, it doesn't make any sense. You should vote against this because we can't generate ground. He's also dropping our standard of real world education that we don't learn how the Supreme Court actually functions if they just give you a one line plan text additionally, saying that it's a, you should extend our voting issues here first for potential abuse. He's conceding that you should vote on potential abuse, which means that even if you don't necessarily see specific abuse in this round, you can vote here also for ground that we lose our competitive counterplan ground. Also, we don't know what the internal links are, i.e., what tests they're using under the Commerce Clause and how this actually functions. You should extend that this is a voting issue for those reasons above and fairness on the counterplan. His first argument is permitting the counterplan, but you, if this permutation necessarily be severance, our, and it's really legitimate, our counterplan is plan minus we do everything that their plan does in the same application of the law, except for under gender, which means that this will be severed. We base our 1NC strategy on the plan. If they can sever out, then the negative 2 whenever they'll generate any ground. This is a voting issue. He's, we have no solvency advocate, but all of our solvency advocates are necessarily our authors that we read, for example, on the Commerce Clause can and gender violence that would reject their application of the Commerce Clause. There is no reason why we can't apply the Commerce Clause in all cases except gender when we specifically have authors that say, Applying the Commerce Clause case to gender would be bad. He says it's fundamentally unpredictable, but you can read the plan text and the counter plan text after the round. The counter plan text is much more predictable and more clear to tell what's going on than their necessarily vague plan. This would be checked back on this. He says there's no offense on this, but all of our offense is coming on Commerce Clause and gender violence. They should be prepared to have a gender debate when they run Morrison and also about Commerce Clause when that's the ground. We give them plenty of offense to turn this. We are having a good debate. There's no voting issue next. He says picks are bad, but picks are good. And one debate is the search for the best policy. If anything other than the plan alone is better than negative wins, and picks are more rural. Actual debate is often between very two singular policies opposed Two radically different ones and three aligned picks for most better case writing for fewer loopholes and picks for C from defend every part of the 1AC which they should have to do. And they have a gender advantage, so they should be prepared to defend that and the app can still attack the competition run for a specific counter plan that says this proves alone that there's no abuse in picks as it us more about these specific parts of the plan. Additionally, if we are winning some of our arguments on the T flow, you should give us leniency on the picks bait to the point where their vague plan necessarily justifies our vague pick and there's no voting issue for competitive equity. He doesn't explain how competitive equity is justified. He says it's a moving target, but we will not shift in this round. Next he says he doesn't solve because of confusion, but except my argument from above about how our counterplan text is actually more clear on what Commerce Clause jurisprudence would be after the counterplan as opposed to what it would be after the plan. Next, he says, federalism precedent needs an explicit overrule, but Morrison's decision is not necessarily key to federalism. This is Bradley and 2K4. Morrison answers to the question raised by Lopez without inevitably raising at least many questions and answered. It's not forced its own command of a major retrenchment of federal criminal law. It's actually holding it up for a liberty step. However, it seems the impact to be rather narrow. His next argument is perm to you both, but this is impossible. Our counterplan is plan minus. This perm doesn't make any sense. Also, it would still link to all of our Commerce Clause and gender arguments, which means that the perm is irrelevant. Our counterplan competes off next benefits. Next, he says the counterplan is key for lower Courts, but you should extend my answer above about how our text is more key. Next, he reads gold farm evidence and says, Don't solve the world of the counterplan, but first, he's conceding the two pieces of psi evidence that my partner reads in the one and which specifically say that states are using therapeutic approaches right now, which means these don't link to our arguments because they're not using the criminalized approach where they have to get money from their victim or the civil approach. They're so using a different approach which has a chance to solve, even if there is some violence right now, as per their now it is. Our evidence suggests they don't necessarily solve better in the long term, where as they have no chance of solving, will actually reproduce some kind of worse benefits and community based media approaches will solve domestic violence in the status quo. This national Advisor Council on Violence Against Women. Victim attitudes complain and make to generate news coverage that's been a positive message to community leaders, small and the single band organized awareness activities in the 1990s generated news coverage of the public hearings of violence, Southeast community, large American cities, generated source of violence, and told 
the street newspapers, local radio, television stations, also direct positively to war winning campaign and offered hours of free airtime for public service. <coughs> to mark that. And only states provide accountability for domestic violence, but federal action has no hope of solving this in BC 05. When I think of the courts, when it comes to violence, forget about it. Of course, although to hold state actors accountable, maybe better to wait to battle in the state legislature rather than the world state court. Federal courts provide neither their remedy nor the relief for battle women's so much easier to hold this crowd accountable through the battle state and federal policymakers have joined the zero tolerance bandwagon and their argument that we need to do the plan to solve now. States only responded because Bob was struck down. Your plan only risk derailing state efforts. This is a gold sheet in 2000. Federal and state legislatures are going to respond with alternative statutory formulations. For example, during the debate over the authorization of Bob's funding for business, several members of Congress such introduced their revised civil rights remedy to retain Bob's essential elements. We would rather correct the aspects of Bob with approved fatal under courts analysis. Just in several states, we introduced now the legislation will provide a parallel remedy in state courts to produce general motivated violence seeking for their injuries. And on to Congress. His first argument was that torts, the tort would settle out of court, that there's no statute of limitations, but this is missing the point of our argument. This is not necessarily a tort argument. Our argument is when you use the logic of commerce for human rights, in this case, gender violence would necessarily be bad. This is a net benefit to the counterplan because the counterplan doesn't include women under this economic regime, which means this argument is not responsive. Next, they say commodification is inevitable, but there's no warrant for this argument. Our argument is right now. Women are in the private sphere, or else they would have no uniqueness for advantage. We argue that's a good thing because bringing them into the public sphere force is them to be evaluated on an economic level because that's all the public sphere cares about. He says it's just inherent because there's lack of federal right now. But this is a net benefit to the counterplan because there is no right. There, women are not forced in the federal courts right now, which means that we necessarily not include this unique benefit to the counterplan. He says this falls outside the scope in the case. Is a disab, but the case is not a disab. We solve for the entirety of the case except the gender advantage, but we are critiquing their gender advantage to say that it would actually be worse for women post the plan. Next, he reads a Pope evidence that plan does exactly the opposite, but you should prefer our Pope evidence. It's pretty specific and long about why including human rights under the Commerce Clause necessarily be bad. Also, their own McKibben evidence specifically says women need economic value. That's the internal link to why bringing women in the public sphere is good. All of our authors assume this and necessarily critique that. You can extend our resident evidence, which conceded that says using these commerce clause and the logic of commerce necessarily to dilute the commitment to equality and reinforces the worst gender stereotypes, which means we are turning their patriarchy advantage. Actually, says micropolitical challenges can't solve, but this doesn't make any sense. We're not arguing that micropolitical challenges is a net benefit to the counterplot. We still take action, even if it do. At worst, we'd be a state challenge. Their evidence is not specific to state only micropolitical. Next, he says perm do both, but the perm doesn't make sense. There is no alternative. It's just a net benefit to the counterplot. It doesn't do both. doesn't make sense in a world in which there's no alternative. We don't include them under the system. Also, there's no explanation of what it means in addition to the permutation would still link to the logic of the monetary system. Next, he says, solves the monetary answers on a case that, that he will answer this. But you should accept, first of all, our resident evidence answered above all. So they completely concede our Sweeney evidence, which says that economic payments devalue people to all life, which means that even if women don't settle out of the courts and they actually do get money from their attackers, then that is letting women evaluate their worth based on money. Additionally, economics convert value on the object and the law matches those objects. Such a way to assert social high increase continue to exist. The law appears objective. This rules to mass meditation of the law to solution of social problems. This is Boyle in 85. Critical legal scholars recognize the law scholars I minimize their growth policy. Law policy seems to clash with of laws. We might identify with these and other titles for the facts of social justice, which they proceed as now, surely sacred to preserve the message. Most sacred secular reason odds are merely domination paper and the alienation of the dominators produced to the notable point of against responses and modes of operation within the economic apparatus and foretold planning and commodities, which need to decide human behavior and additionally using the market to justify social policy strengthens the pervasive nature of neoliberalism and creates no meaning outside of capital. This is Brown No. 3. It's fusion of both the state with the economic rationality, the radical transforming, and iron critical for social policy, political rationality, and neoliberalism might be read as issuing from the state of capitalism, which simply underscored Marx's argument that capital penetrates. The transforms every aspect of life, we make everything is introducing every value activity outside of cold rationality, the existence of market rationality, every sphere, and the central distribution of moral political judgments, cost of analysis, represent precisely the evisceration of substantive values by instrumental world that what predicts its future outside the central world, thinking, judging, reducing to moral calculations, polar, artsy, dark system, night, and on to case. His first argument on our Reagan evidence is that they, there's money to come, but he doesn't ever explain to you how women will be able to get the money to afford lawyers and actually be able to get to their court. That's their argument. Even if the civil rights remedy is a good idea in the abstract, our Reagan evidence argues that it's meaningful on the symbolic level. His Davis evidence about how suits are representative aren't responsive to our argument that even if some suits aren't reported, that doesn't make sense. Why? They would be brought here as bad as the evidence is also not responsible, which is a massive solvency deficit, which means if you give us any risk of the counterplan, that commerce logic is bad in a world in which they don't solve for gender violence, you should vote for the counterplan. Also, his Picard, his only answer to our Picard evidence is overall vava, but our Picard evidence is really good about how women have to play a role when they go in front of the court, i.e. tort reform, that they have to act the role of the victim so that the court thinks they're pathetic in order to pay them, which is a straight turn to patriarchy because it reinforces the worst gender stereotypes of men over women. Additionally, you should extend our able evidence. He says tort law is more empowering and is supposed to commonalities, but our able evidence is directly responsive to this and better that tort remedy only affirms those who have wealth and can necessarily get to torts and have better lawyers in order to sue their attackers, which necessarily bad and exposes worse forms of structural violence because it reinforces the hierarchies inside our Bull Miller evidence. He's right. It's about criminalization. We're not going to go for it. Extend his, ar extend his argument that there's no impact to this. Uh, I want to read you the part you read that says uh, this cold shield evidence that says states only respond because law will strike down. Uh, 
Several members of Congress sought to introduce a revised civil remedy that would retain VAWA's essential elements but would correct the aspects of law that prove vital in the court's analysis. In addition, several states have introduced analysts and adult, I can't pronounce that word, legislation that would provide a parallel remedy in state court. I guess I'm confused why it doesn't say because of this, several states, but in addition to That's it. Or, I'm yeah. I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, I guess I don't understand why that says because the federal. I mean, that evidence just says Congress tried. Well, this evidence talks about all of the actions that the state is taking after Baba, right? Do all 50 states have these uh, the therapy courts? I don't know. I don't want to give you wrong information. Well, sure, sure. I'm not sure how many of the 50 if states If all 50 have states these. don't have the therapy courts, I guess that seems kind of damning to the ability to, I mean, how like, would If you state... want to read a piece of evidence that says only 38 states have it, that's fine. But our PSI evidence, which you're not answering, is pretty specific that these therapeutic approaches are solving, at least in some states right now. We'll argue that this I, I guess approach is effective. It will sure. spread to I, other states. I guess I'm also confused on why isn't gender violence decreased if these therapeutic approaches are solving? Our argument is that, like, it's not going to immediately decrease in whatever time period since VAWA. I guess it's like five or six years by now or seven years. Our argument is that it's at least a better strategy as opposed to your strategy, which brings them into the public sphere, which we have pretty good insights on why that's a bad idea for women. Uh, this brown evidence and this boil evidence you read is these economic kind of calculation batteries. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm confused. If you don't have an alternative, what's the uniqueness to The alternative is the counterplan. But the counterplan doesn't counterplan, and you don't ban all the neoliberals and what's going down in the statute. Sure, we can't solve for all of the neoliberal regime, but we would argue that it keeping women out of this neoliberal regime is a net benefit to the counterplan. Well, yeah, it's a net benefit, but I guess I'm saying, like, there's a big economic collapse happening now. The counterplan avoids the affirmative's additional economic collapse. I don't understand. I'm not sure where you're referring to economic collapse. Well, I don't understand. The we don't make, like, a crash the economy argument. Our brown evidence talks about how when people are included within this neoliberal order, the only meaning to their life comes out of economics. As per your 1AC okay. evidence, which sure. is women need to be sure. private in terms I guess of economic with, with that, you, you kind of even talk about this in your speech a little bit when you say, well, sure, they have other means to do so. I guess I'm confused. Uh, if women can make a choice, either they get economics, they get redress, they don't have to do the civil remedy at all. How are we coercive to them or disempowering to them or calculating their lives if they make that autonomous choice? Well, our argument is that using the logic to like bringing women into the sphere, like whether or not women actually go in, we would argue that that means probably you can't solve because all of your McKinnon evidence talks about bringing them into the public sphere. But saying that their worth should be based on economic value, that like that's how they should be valued in front of the courts, those women that do go in anyway, we'd argue that's a bad idea. But, but if those women want to do so, I guess, why is that a bad idea? If they, they want, want to be valued, to so, like, if they want to be valued economically and want to go to the court and want to get economic. Like, we would argue that's a problem with the overall system that in order to be accepted, they have to go to this public sphere, which is economic, which is necessarily bad. Like, okay. It may be attractive in the short term for women because they get this immediate recognition in the public sphere, but we would argue that in the long term, it devalues their existence. Okay. It's going to be bad for them. Can we take a second approach, please? Mm -hmm. you got more